The book of Job is looked at by most most biblical scholars believe it was the first uh, book of the Bible that was actually written. And so there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of information in the book of Job about creation, the nature of creation, about the angelic host, about Satan, how he operates against us. It's really a, uh, uh, an informative book, but you have to take some time sometimes uh, because there are certain things like I tell people, we were talking about it today at uh, breakfast, you know, uh, that um, like the, our English translation, and I love my King James Bible, but even even though I believe it's the best English translation, um, we lose some things at times. We don't get the full meaning unless we look it up in the original language. And for the, Bi- the Old Testament, it was primarily Hebrew, and of course the New Testament was Greek. So you have to look these things up. So the context of Job, and you always look at the context as well. So you look at the context of Job 38, 14, and this is where God finally gets tired of, you know, all of them running their mouths. And he says, you know, hey, you know, stand up and, uh, and uh, like a man and answer me. Were you there? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where were you when I created? I mean, he's really putting Job and his friends, you know, in their place. They think they know, you know, all these things, just like us. We think we know everything. And he's putting them in their place. So in that context, it's going down through there. And, of course, in that passage, in that chapter, it talks about the ends of the earth. And then it says this about the earth. It says in the in the King James, it says, It is turned as clay to the seal, uh, and they stand out as a garment. Now, I have read over that many times. And that's the problem. A lot of times we just read over stuff, and we don't look it up. So uh, I saw this verse pointed out by someone. So I got my my uh, Strong's Hebrew you know, concordance with the Hebrew dictionary. Mm-hmm. And I looked up the word turned. It doesn't mean to spin. It means it's changed. I tell people that it means it's changed like I would change, uh, you know, I would change potatoes into mashed potatoes. It's, you change them into something else. And then it says where it says it's turned or it's changed as clay to the seal. The Hebrew word there for seal means signet ring. And so what would happen was in the old days that the kings or governors or leaders would have this special ring that identified them. And what they would do with them when they seal letters or, or scrolls, they would drop some wax or some clay on top of them, and then they would press them down flat with that signet ring. So when God was talking about the earth and how he formed it, the picture, the word picture he gives in Hebrew is that it was changed as clay to the signet ring, plastic, pushed down flat. Oh, and when that happens, too, it causes an upturned edge. It causes a border around it and you look at any seal there's going to be a border around that press down um you know piece of wax or clay or whatever it is right. but it even gets more interesting some people say well that's old testament you know maybe it was just figurative language or metaphors and then you know again you keep studying i, I was preparing to preach a message several weeks ago on the marriage supper of the lamb and again the second coming of jesus I focus in on that a lot. So I wasn't even thinking flat earth. I wasn't studying the flat earth. It wasn't on my mind. So I'm reading Revelation chapter 20. And, and this is Revelation 20 is, you know, about, um, the, the very end when, when Jesus returns and Satan, the angel takes Satan, Lucifer and bounds him for a thousand years and puts him in the bottomless pit. And Jesus rules and reigns upon the earth. For a thousand years of peace. And then the Bible says at the end of that thousand years, he will be loosed for a little season. Okay. And he will go forth. It says in the King James that he will go forth into, uh, the four corners of the earth. Matter of fact, I'm going to read it right here. It's Revelation 27 through 9. It says, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters, or it should be translated four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And verse 9 says this, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and destroyed them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So I'm reading this passage, right? I'm, Cause I'm going to talk about the marriage supper and that's all in Revelation 19. And I'm just reading the chapters before and after. And I read this and, and the Holy Spirit got my attention because it was like they went up on the breadth of the earth. And the question came in my head. Why doesn't it say they just, why doesn't it just say they went up on the earth? So. I looked up the word breadth, and this was 
What an amazing revelation because this is confirmation of Job 38, 14. The word in the Greek when it was originally written is in the Strong's Dictionary. It's number 4114 Greek, and it is the word platos, P-L-A-T-O-S, platos. Well, immediately when I saw that, I thought, wow, that sounds like our word or a root word of our word plateau, which I know means level, flat land, mm. elevated land, but level and flat. So I, when I looked this up, plateaus in the Strong's Greek Dictionary is defined that as width and breadth. But then it says that it's from the root word, 4116, plateaus. And here is the exact, I'm reading it, I'm looking at the Strong's Dictionary right here. It says, Platus, spread out flat. I was blown away when I saw this. Because, see, a number of years ago, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with Bible prophecy. So I, was studying, so I was studying the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse. And then, of course, the King James, in most English translations, translate the, pale, uh, the fourth horse as the pale horse with the rider of death. Well, what I discovered a number of years ago, and I heard another minister bring it out to my attention, he said the Greek word for pale is chloros. He said now the word chloros in the Greek definition, it could be translated, it's really green or pale green. But the translators, when they decided to translate it pale, thought we've never seen a green horse. So we're going to translate it pale. And so it's not technically incorrect. It's just, you know, everywhere else in the Bible, the word chloros is for green grass or green trees. So the word should have been green horse. Well, it says that green horse has authority or power over one quarter of the earth and that it will kill with the sword. But well, once you know it's a green horse, then you, and you know the sacred color of Islam is green and that there's 1. Uh, there's 1.8 billion Muslims and 7 billion people and you do the math right now, they have authority over one quarter of the earth and Sharia laws to kill by the sword. Once you realize that, you really get the full meaning of the passage. Mm. And that's what happens with this verse in Revelation 20. Literally, it should be translated just like uh, that about the in Revelation 6 about the green horse. It, it should be translated the green horse. This one should be translated and they went up on the flat earth. And uh, and then when you start going into uh, the passages like, for instance, Psalm 19 talks about the, the sun going to the ends of the earth. And the sun moving in a circuit or a revolution above us. Um, there's another passage that talks about the sun being in the clouds, which confirms the pictures and the videos we're seeing from all over. In fact, I went to Birmingham, Alabama yesterday uh, to help my daughter move in. She's starting her second year at the uh, at UAB. And we were driving back home, my wife, my dad, my, my youngest daughter. We see the sun over there in the clouds. And sure enough, there were clouds behind the sun. And we took pictures. We, I have, we have the pictures, and you can see the clouds behind the sun. Well, the clouds, that shows it can't be 93 million miles away in outer space and have clouds behind it. And that's really been the, the eye-opening thing here is, is that the creation, the earth being flat, the sun, the moon, and the stars being inside the firmament, as Genesis chapter 1 says it, they are, right. them not being far away from us. Um, once you realize and you start seeing it with your eyes, then you go, wow, the Bible really is true. God really, the, the God of the Bible really is our heavenly father. He really is our creator. Jesus really is the savior of the world. Truth, real truth. And I'll say this real truth always points you back to the God of truth. And as Jesus said in John 14, six, he said, I am the way, the truth. And the life and that creation, you know, Psalm 19, he said that the creation, uh, the heavens and the firmament, he said, show and declare his glory. So, I, you know, people who tell I have Christians say this doesn't matter. No, 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 no. The most the most foundational thing to the Bible is that God is the creator of heaven and earth and mankind. And therefore, he has a moral. He has the moral right to demand that we live a certain way.